this topic is, I'm wedging in as the end of the first session where we covered all the topics you know we covered because most of you have attended most, most of it. And between the next session when we move more into the mysteries, the holy sacraments, and the things that form our petition in the, our participation in the Christian life within the church. So today we're going to talk about the spiritual life and spiritual warfare. There's a popularity about spirituality today that's just oozed all over the culture. It's an ongoing interest, and many people are seeking a personal experience of God and a tangible, dynamic experience of His presence within their daily lives. Now, they might not call it God, they might call it the divine power, they might call it all kinds of things. Um, they satisfy this need through a variety of means. There's been a huge growth in the last uh, 20 years especially of various pseudo-Christian cults and other such religious movements. I say pseudo-Christian because that even captures a lot of what's going on and what people think are is normal Christianity because they're, they're not following any of the principles of their of, the, of the, their history and tradition of Christianity, even in the West. Um, there's also a steady interest in spirituality from the Mid Near East, the Middle East, from the Far East, and also with very negative results, there is the rising popularity of satanic and occult practices, as well as witchcraft, neo-pagan rituals, and, and uh, other New Age kind of ceremonies and religious movements. Basically, anything remotely connected with the world of psychic phenomena and the occult is attracting people one way or another. Um, but no matter how flawed or misguided some of those things are, the, those, the, the whole panoply of, of spiritualities that are out there, um, it shows an innate desire for participation in a divine life, and that is innate to the human being. And exactly having that connection, that desire, is why man was created. To have a life in communion with God is man's natural orientation. So rather than frowning on it, as is common, you know, uh, you get all these books published about the cults. You know, there've been for the last 30 years, I know, there's every few years another book about cults comes out. Rather than being negative, we need to how to find out within our own Christian salvation, where the or Christian um, heritage, where that the um, answers to those movements of the heart and movements of inspiration are coming from. <clears throat> We need to actually find out where salvation is about being reborn in the spirit itself. The spiritual life begins with rebirth, and the rebirth is about throwing off the old man and being renewed or transformed through a spiritual life. The Christian life begins with baptism and regular communion in the Holy Mysteries. According to the Holy Fathers, these mysteries are precisely what follows baptism and have everything to do with following Christ, these mysteries of the church. From John 3, 6, 7, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. So that, of course, is a cornerstone in Christian circles everywhere, but what he's speaking about is the old man dying to the old man and being born in the Spirit and being a new creature. There's also a verse that says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And many people who thought were following him thought that was a hard saying and, and stopped following him at the time. But these two verses in particular show the mystery of baptism and the mystery of communion that, that follows it. So, if we're going to be born, reborn by the waters of baptism and live in the mysteries of communion, we have what we would call salvation 
that grows in the practice of those things, or praxis. Praxis is a Greek term that it means a function implying a sustained activity or responsibility. That's praxis. A sustained responsibility or activity. The spiritual life in which we are practicing the presence of God is what praxis is. So it's possible to experience the presence of God. We, we perform praxis so that we actually end up having an experience of God. So it's with praxis, the sustained activity and responsibility for a spiritual life, that we wage spiritual warfare. This warfare is against the devil and all his minions. It's against the flesh and it's against the world. Those three things are pop up with the fathers and, and in scripture. The devil, the flesh, and the world. Paul writes and compare those who once were in bondage and death and have since become partakers of life eternal and shows who it is that is the object of our spiritual warfare. So let's read from Paul, Ephesians 2, verses 2 through 3. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, and among whom also we all had our conversion in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the, the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for he hath great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So I'm going to dissect that for a minute because it talks about the spiritual warfare, and it talks about what was before. You were dead in trespasses, in times past, you walked according to the course of the world and according to the prince of, of the power of the air. But the spirit that is now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom we also had our conversion in times past from the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling all desires of the flesh, and we were by nature the children of wrath. But God, who's rich in mercy and his great love, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ. So he contrasts the old man and the new man because he's going to make a point in his letter to the Ephesians. This is just a little snippet to, get con to give context to the rest of the letter. But within it is an important thing that we wage warfare by our spiritual practices. And if you take the Christian practice and boil it down to the three things that we're told we must do. We must have prayer, pray, fast, and give alms. So, it's the devil who is fought by prayer. In the, in the Bible, the, the term the air, the spirits of the air, is a biblical reference to the realm of angels and demons. And the prince of, this, of the power of the air is Satan, and we wage warfare against him by this very thing, by turning to God in prayer. We do not confront the evil one. It's really important you remember that. We don't think we're going to go do head-on battle with demons. We ignore them. And we turn to God in prayer. Prayer is a matter of love. Man expresses love through prayer. And if we pray, it's an indication that we love God. If we don't pray, this indicates that we don't actually love God. For the measure of our prayer is the measure of our love for God. And the devil is vanquished in our love of God. Let's take the second one, the flesh. The flesh is fought by fasting. 
The flesh is speaking of our fallen nature, and we fast to deny the carnal and all of its desires. So disciplined eating and drinking, which means not to be drunk on rich foods or drink or pleasures, is the object of fasting. We are removing ourselves from a life of being engorged in sensual appetites. And sadly, the, the contemporary world appears to think that there is nothing more fitting than doing everything you can to engorge yourself in physical, sensual appetites. Those sensual appetites are the behavior of the base human nature and physical desires. Now, we don't fast because it's, quote, good for us, even though we know that fasting for a time can be good for you. That's not the purpose of us, of spiritual fasting, because it's good for us. We fast to kill the appetites of the flesh. And you could say, nutritionally, as certainly as you fast from sugar and carbs, you go through a period of flu and rejection and your body screaming at you because it wants more, 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 more. But you kill those bad bacteria in the gut. You kill the little critters that are trying to control you. That's a perfect corollary for the spiritual realm of fasting and the purpose of fasting is to say no, just say no, to control the appetites. And thus, we are purifying our person and our body to be a temple of God when we fast. So, the third one is the world. We wage warfare against the devil, against the flesh, and against the world. The world is fought by almsgiving. The world is not about, when we talk about the term the world, the, uh, you know, fighting against the pull of the world. We're not talking about creation as God made it. Rather, it refers to the ways of culture and society that oppose the Lord. These are man-made institutions, or more importantly, the ungodly trends in the world, like materialism or naturalism, or desire for instant gratification, basically drowning out our godly empathy for the condition of the world around us because we are not alone. Everywhere we go, we're around people who are hurting, starving, in need. They're hungry, they're naked. And I don't mean physically, I mean they just don't have a connection to godliness or to the love of family and brothers and sisters that we all are in reality. So instead of hoarding what we have and keeping to ourselves, and thinking that our family is the only thing that we care about. We're to use all the gifts that we have for acts of mercy. And it's famous saying amongst the fathers that we have the rich for the support of the poor and the poor we have for the salvation of the rich. It goes hand in hand. From God's abundance, and we are the people of abundance in this country, it doesn't, doesn't matter how much you think you're struggling or are poor, we're people of abundance. From our abundance, we give alms to those in need. From the abundance of our heart, the abundance of God's love, the abundance of our gifts, the abundance of our time, the abundance of our talents, all of that is meant to be poured out in, in the, to the people around us. And thus he says in Matthew 25, you fed me when I was hungry. You gave me drink when I was thirsty. You clothed me when I was naked. You visited me when I was in prison. You cared for me when I was in, uh, when I was sick. All of those examples. Are, we are to pour out our lives for others if we want to be counted worthy of being his brother and sisters and live in eternity. So denying the world is to claim our Lord and King as the source of our life. He is not of this world, our security is not of this world, and we don't fret about things in this world. We fight the world, its institutions, 
its trends, its mindset, the zeitgeist of the world around us. Because even works that appear to be merciful without faith are dead. There's no salvation in just being a do-gooder. We have to understand that divinity is the source of everything good that we do and that it is up and, and we can't give what is needed unless we're connected. Okay, so that's Christian praxis in a nutshell in three things. The praxis of fight, waging war against the devil, the flesh, and the world. But remember, praxis is shown throughout Scripture. Praxis is what we must do, not what God does. The over abundance on and that are by works we can do nothing. The, I mean, the overemphasis on by works we can do nothing and that everything is by God's grace has to be. Um, modified by understanding that we must do is what praxis is about. It's what we must do. And what we must do is defined by Christ himself. I'm going to give you four sh ones. There's probably 60 commandments of Christ. I'm going to give you four where he tells us, this is what you must do. And if you've never seen a list of them, I'll get you it. But you have to email me to remind me to send it to you. It's, a, it's amazing when you just read the way, what he's commanded of us. From John 13, 34, A new commandment I give you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. We have to do that. If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We have to do that. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your fa heavenly Father is perfect. Oops, we have to do that. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that we must do. And the church gives us the tools to do it because it has preserved the all that I have commanded you part of Christ's incarnation. So what we believe becomes what we do. It's our praxis. We must be believing at all times, in all places. Growing in perfection. It begins in this world, and it ends up in the world to come. But it never ends. You will always be believing if you put your foot on the path. That is the foundation of spiritual praxis. Now, in all these things, we're guided by both scripture and tradition. For example, more scripture. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold to the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or are by our epistle. And as I'd like to say... Paul would spend two years in a city and then later we get have two letters we're trying to preserve the what he said and taught and did with people for those two years certainly having as a cornerstone the two letters he might have written but that's what's passed on and preserved as the praxis the traditions that the church preserves and from 2 Thessalonians but we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly. And not according to the tradition which he received from us. And thus we have to have, not as a matter of judging, not as a matter of, of neglecting, not as a matter of not helping, but as a matter of keeping your spiritual practice and your spiritual life focused on the traditions and the scripture that you've been given, and we must live that way. And we don't just sort of, we are all God's children it and go off into every goofy thing and have a good time with every situation that people would take us in. We, we don't walk in a quote uh, with, the, with people who've departed from the truths of the faith. Now this tradition that 
I've been talking about here in these couple of scriptures. And the tradition of the gospel teachings, of course, they began with the apostles. And the first place it's recorded that we know of by the apostles themselves, which predate the, the gospels, is the Didache. And the Didache opens up with a sentence that says, there are two ways, one of life and one of death. And there's a great difference between the two ways. And then it goes on to say, and the way of life is this. And one of the things they say there, before we ever have scripture that says it, one of the examples they give, the way of life is, to be ye perfect and sin not. That's the way of life. Don't sin. The vigilant spiritual practice, the waging of war, would have to be consuming you all the time just to feel like I, I have a chance to actually uh, do that. Thus it becomes instead a praxis of a lifetime because it, we, on pins and needles, any moment we, can, we keep finding ourselves failing. And then it also goes on and says, the way of death is this. And in a world like today, man, I, I never say this too much, but recently I've been saying it. You can't fornicate. Duh. I mean, you can't indulge in the flesh and expect to live. Because the way of life is preserved not only by the things the apostles wrote there, but also by the teachings of the early fathers, and it continues with the holy elders up today throughout the church. The teachings of the way of life. And when we say way of life, what the apostles meant by the way of life and what it really means, isn't what's used in the common vernacular. Well, the way of my way of life, you know, people sometimes use that term. There's only one way of life. Because the way of life means to acquire a life that is eternally deified. The way of life is a life eternal in deification. So deification has three stages in its process of transformation. I'll use the Greek terms, catharsis, theoria, and theosis. Three stages in what? The process of transformation. Transformation is a description of the process of salvation. If you would be saved, you go through this process of transformation. Not the concept of salvation. I, one of our ladies in church said that a priest told her once that the Protestant view of salvation is a light switch. There comes a point where you flick it on and, then, and you're good to go. And the, and the concept of salvation in the Roman Catholic Church is you flick it on and then you flick it off. And then you flick it on and it gets flicked off. And then you flick it on and it gets flicked off. In the Orthodox world, it is a growth. Like it's more like the growth of a tree withstanding the vicissitudes of life and weather and all the things that happen, but it is growth, and it's growth by our will and the grace of God in cooperation. Salvation has as its goal theosis, and it is the purpose of life, and it's only achieved through a synergy of praxis and grace. Our will is in praxis and grace, the responsible follow through of what we're given to be receptacles of, of what is divine. This is salvation by grace. When salvation by grace is talked about in the scripture, it's everything we do to allow God's grace to align our will 
and our actions, our lives, our thoughts, everything we are, to God so that his grace can do its work in us. And so in the scripture, when it says, faith without works is dead, it points to this cooperation synergy. That's why they tried to get rid of it. You know, in the Protestant era, there was an attempt to get rid of the book of James because it, they didn't like that, that grace without works is dead. It contradicted their concepts. So, if we are taking up Christ's calling and living a spiritual life in the framework of the spiritual laws, it will bring us to that life of purification. That's the praxis, the life of purification, or the Greek word I used a minute ago, catharsis. Now, if we're living that life, and by the way, we do that the rest of our lives, constant purification. As surely as you must weed your garden. If your garden grew year-round and never ever went into dormant, guess what you'd be doing year-round? You'd be weeding that garden or you'd lose everything. And the minute you take your eye off the ball, you go on a vacation or you just say, I oh, forget it, I'm going to wait and weed it. I'm going to wait and weed it next in the fall when the fruit's ready. Forget it. There's nothing left to, to salvage. So, Purification, we will always be doing. And if we are blessed, and if we apply ourselves, there's a possibility of experience in theoria, which is illumination or the vision of God, the actual inner experience of coming uh, of, of Him. And that's done on the way to fulfilling the purpose of human life, which is theosis or deification. Purification, illumination, deification are English words that it's also called being glorified or being in union with God. Now, I'm talking about that as core to the spiritual life, and I want you to also know that it is actually found in the Bible, and people aren't aware of it because they don't know how. If you don't know what to look for, and you don't aren't taught the tradition of what a spiritual life is about and what the goals are and what the things you must do, you can't find it in the Bible. You take a almost illiterate translation that's centuries and cultures removed from its source and you do the best you can with the English words. And it's amazing actually that it, I think it's a testimony to God's grace in the very words of scripture that so much has been preserved. Doesn't mean humans don't ignore it, but the, but it's amazing, you can still take the, an English translation that was done by a king in rebellion to the Pope who was already disconnected from the tradition of the church. You can take all of those problems and all the time since, and you can still find all the divine grace blaring at you. Now what, what you need is the tradition of the church, the spiritual life of the church to help you see what it's teaching you. So let's look at 2 Peter 1 4. Here you go. By which you have been given, excuse me, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be made partakers of the divine nature. You will become a partaker of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Another one that points to this deification. John 1, 3, 3. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we shall know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We will experience him as he is, which means he who is, is as the eternal I am. We will experience it and we should, because we shall be like him, so we will be capable of experiencing it. Paul teaches about our ultimate transformation into the likeness of Christ in Romans 8.29. 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. We will be conformed, changed, transformed into the image of Christ. And he will be the first of the brethren who are in that um, step, state of being. So the fact that the apostles John, Peter, and Paul taught theosis shows the orthodox teaching as a solid biblical basis. Now, they weren't trying to teach it theosis as directly as you might hear the elders do because that was part of the tradition that was the background. It wasn't the good news. The good news was Jesus Christ, him crucified, and the fact that he has changed all of mankind. What we must do for the rest of our lives is the traditions of, in the traditions of the church. Now, Protestants, especially the um, Reformed Calvinists, are mistaken when they claim that theosis was the result of 14th century theologians misreading the 5th to 8th century fathers. Because When I say mistaken, it's because it existed all the way back at, in the 1st and 2nd centuries, like Irenaeus of Lyon, who was a spiritual grand, he was a spiritual grandson of Paul, I mean of John. In other words, he, he was a student of Polycarp. Polycarp, is it Polycarp in the icon? The icon of John, the apostle, the one who's taking down and doing the writing. Polycarp taught Irenaeus. Irenaeus says, he who was the Son of God became the Son of Man that man might become the Son of God. Clement of Alexandria, born in about 150 AD, said, Yea, I say, the Word of God became man so that you might learn from a man how to become a God. And Athanasius the Great, now he's respected by evangelicals everywhere, for his defense of the deity of Christ on the, on the Incarnation. That's the one that C.S. Lewis said, if he could only have one book other than the Bible, that's the book he'd want to have. Anyway, he taught the doctrine of theosis. He was born in the third century and lived uh, his life, uh, lived his life into the fourth century. Athanasius wrote, um, Christ was made man that we might be made God. Basil the Great described the human person as a creature who has received the order to become a God. And this was echoed and taught and preserved and echoed and preserved and taught all the way from the time of the Apostles. So these teachings are all based on Genesis 126 which teaches that humanity was created in the image of God. We do not become God by nature. Rather, we become like God by grace. We share in his life, love, and glory, the same life, love, and glory that the Son has with the Father, we have with the Son. If we know the Son, we know the Father. So there's a unity of being and divinity of experience that is deification. That kind of oneness with God, it doesn't exist anywhere except in Christianity in the East. They have concepts like self-emptying where you lose all of the clutter of this world or even self-realization like Yogananda taught and others. But Oneness with God in the sense of union with God, person to person with God, the real direct experience and becoming God-like doesn't exist anywhere except in the Christian world. Now, this salvation, which is this, stands within a context of a tradition called hesychism. And 
Again, salvation means transformation. Transformation uh, is experienced within hesychism. Hesychism is the practice of silence, the practice of stilling the mind. It's core to the process of purification and of emptying and of coming into union with God. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, most, some of this is taken from a couple of books by Herotheus and by Maximus um, words in Mountain of Silence. And uh, a monk, Maximus of Mount Athos, whose lectures I attended. But the point is, there is a really good example that helps us understand this. And the example is about logismi. Logismi, or assaultive thoughts. That's a good way to think of them. Logismi, or assaultive thoughts. Um, in some traditions that aren't Christian, they're known also, they're known outside of Christianity, sometimes called thought forms. There's other terms for them too, and I've forgotten them. So, and let me try to describe it like this. We swim in a sea of thoughts. It's all around us because we're in, people are radiating their thoughts, even though we can't hear inside the, the crane, outside of their cranium. We don't hear it with, with our ears, with our senses. But we swim in this sea, and this collective zeitgeist of our culture is a stew in which we grow. So even secular um, sociologists go to great lengths to describe this term zeitgeist, which is the kind of the culmination of the culture. We live in the zeitgeist of being mindful and politically correct. It shaped everything that happens and how we think and what we do. It impacts us. It's a, and the thought forms that are within that zeitgeist can be assaultive. We can feel very ginger about doing what otherwise would be natural, naive, um, and, and harmless. But we can't do it because of assaultive thoughts. Now, a stand, a understanding assaultive thoughts and how to deal with them is key to living a victorious Christian life. This term loges me. Uh, it's spelled L-O-G-I-S-M-O-I. But the pronunciation is loges me. That's just the English transliteration. Um, loges me are thoughts and thought images that come to us with the intention, intentionally, to lead us away from Christ. They're distracting and are a result of the fall of mankind. St. John Climacus, in his Ladder of Divine Ascent, speaks of various stages of how they afflict us and how we should deal with them. Now in that book, Mountain of Silence, and I might have gotten it in already. Did We'll see. In that book, anyway, Kyriakos Markidis, a sociologist from University of Maine, explores the understanding in his conversation with Father Maximus, who is a monk from Mount Athos. In, and wrote, wrote all about this in the, in the Mountain of Silence. Um, Metropolitan Herotheus's book called Orthodox Psychotherapy explains that loges me are caused by warfare with the devil. Loges me are the consequences of evil thoughts. He addresses battling and curing evil thoughts through watchfulness, attentiveness, Hezekiah, and just cu plain cutting off evil thoughts. And in that book, he references lots of patristic writers. Hezekiah the priest, Gregory of Sinai, Maximus the confessor, Evagrius, and Isaac the Syrian, some of the most uh, illumined uh, fathers through the centuries. 
Now, in Mountain of Silence, Father Maximus states that this. He says, the holy elders identify five stages of the development of logismi. And of course, we're talking about the logismi that go contrary to God's laws. Not all logismi go contrary. Some are just distracting. Some are just a waste of time. So, I want to talk about these because this gets to the core of how you are tempted and you need to know how these things work so you can be watchful and begin cutting off temptation through your own spiritual practice and attentiveness. So the first stage in the encounter with thought forms is what's called the assault stage. It's when the logis me first attacks our mind. So this is like a thought enters the mind in the form of a suggestion, urging us to do something like steal. Okay, a little thought form. The logis me knocks on the door of our minds and says, hey, look, there's some money. Nobody's looking, you might as well just take it. Now, I've had logis me that are way worse than that. They're kind of going, ooh, where did that come from? And I slap them down when they happen. And you'll find that the saints were constantly attacked. Matter of fact, the more saintly they are, the more this stuff comes after them. I think I, I said today when I was discussing things with somebody, I said, we don't need demons to cause some of the problems we're having. And we got knuckleheads doing it all by themselves. <laughs> the demons go after the holy people, go after the people who are fighting the spiritual warfare. Logias may come after those. So when logias may strike, no matter how sinful it may be, guess what? We're not accountable for the strike. We're not accountable for the thought form that says, hey, there's some money, let's steal it. So the quality of our spiritual state is not evaluated on the basis of an assault. Well, you, I, the fathers don't say this, but I might say, hmm, the more you're assaulted, the holier you must be. It could be just the opposite of how we would normally react. So in simple language, when we're assaulted by a thought like that, we have not committed a sin, meaning we haven't missed the mark because we haven't done anything other than been assaulted. So the holy elders throughout the ages were resent, were relentlessly tempted and assaulted by similar, even worse, logis me. Okay, that's the first stage. Now the second stage is called interaction. First we're assaulted, and then we open a dialogue or an actual exchange with the logis me. Reminds me of that Bill Cosby record I heard when I was about 10 years old or 12 years old about the kid who had mumps and had his tonsils taken out and he's laying there kind of waking up from and a little thought comes in and says, you get to have ice cream. Mm. Here, why don't you swallow some ice cream. Mm -mm. Well, go ahead, you can swallow. It's ice cream. Mm. Kid finally swallows and goes, ah! Because his tonsils were just taken out. He's... But that inner dialogue that Bill Cosby described, that all humans experience, is what I'm talking about here. Let's say the logist me urges you to steal a pile of money and you begin to wonder, gosh, should I do that or should I not? What's going to happen if I steal it? What's going to happen if I don't steal it? This is risky. This is dangerous. See what I'm saying here? Interacting with that initial assault. You've got to do the no. No, 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 no. I'm not doing that. You've got to slap it back down again. Not interact with it. Let's say you interact with it. Even at this stage, there's no accountability on the part of the individual. No sin is yet committed. 
The person can indeed examine such a loge as me and consider several options without being accountable. But if the person is weak by temperament or undisciplined or lacks moral fiber, then defeat may be the most likely outcome of that exposure to the loges me. I can say that my wife always championed being as honest as possible with a cashier at a store. And I have to say, when I was young, I paid no attention. If they gave me too much change, I just walked away. If they forgot something, I thought I would think, oh good, I got something without being charged. She really worked me over without knowing it because I started comparing how I might react to her. So many years ago, I started going, oh, she forgot to charge me. I'd get a little happy feeling. No, I'm not taking that. No, hey, excuse me, you forgot to charge me for this. But I had to work at it. See, we work to, we have work to do. We have to be vigilant. Vigilance doesn't come just because today you hear a lecture and you're going to now go, now go be vigilant. We'll talk about that in a minute. But I want you to understand that you're not accountable at that point, but you're definitely at high risk for the next step, which is the third stage, which is called consent. First there's assault, then there's interaction, then there's consent. You actually consent to commit what the loges me urges you to do. In this particular case, to steal money. Now we live in a society, by the way, where you get on the internet, and I don't know what if I, we have visual loges me called ads. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, maybe I'll buy that. You know what that's like? You know, where you finally say, okay, maybe I really could use those sandals. Those are kind of cool. I'm tired. You said the word sandal, it picked up your voice. All of a sudden you're assaulted with sandals ads. You know what I'm saying? But it's kind of that way. If we're not fighting it, we have to get really rock solid on what we're doing. Now, when you've made a decision to go ahead and take the money, that's when guilt and accountability start to emerge. It is the beginning of sin. And Jesus was referring to this stage when he proclaimed that if you covet a woman in your mind, you've already committed adultery in your heart. The moment the decision is allowed to take root in your heart, then you are well on your way to actually committing the act in the outer world. Stealing the money, you made the decision. Now you're gonna to try to figure out how to do it without getting caught. The fourth stage after consent is called captivity. In the event that a person is unable to free himself from the previous stage, then there is defeat, captivity. He becomes hostage to the loges me. The moment the person succumbs, and the next time around the loges me returns with greater force, it's much more dis difficult to resist the second time. And so it is the next time and the time after that. And thus, that's when the person can no longer retreat and proceeds along with this act, which now becomes a habit that is repeated time and again, and you enter the fifth stage, which is the stage of passion or obsession. It's an addiction. The loges may become an entrenched reality within the consciousness, within the noose itself. It isn't just assaulting from the outside, but it's really got you. The person becomes a captive of obsessive loges me, leading to ongoing destructive acts to oneself and others. Now, this is very, very descriptive of a gambler, compulsive gambler, or pernicious pornography. We actually get rewired in a, in a way that 
we've given over and we've reoriented ourselves in a way that isn't a simple matter to deal with. Well, the elders say that when we become dominated by such passions, it's like giving a key to our heart to Satan so that he can get in and out anytime he wants. Society, overrun with these struggles, desperately is struggling, I'm sorry, society overrun with those struggling with desperately to overcome their obsessive passions and addictions, but without much success. They're fully aware that they, what they do is self-destructive, capable of reasoning with a clarity of mind, but their heart is captive. They can't escape it. They cannot eject themselves. That they can't eject that negative energy from themselves that possesses and controls them. Those are the five stages of the Lojusmi and our descent into sin. When we say that the mother of God was born with original sin, but she was not accountable for personal sin, she was tempted, she had to consider but she slapped it away and lived a life where she was in awe from the time she was three years old of her closeness to God. And then bearing, and then being given to marriage, and then having Christ immediately, given to betrothal and having Christ, bearing that child, raising the Son of God. She was in a state of constantly being able to fight away the logis me. So, these five stages, assault, interaction, consent, captivity, and passion, are more or less all the stages unfold within us, sometimes gradually and sometimes like an avalanche. So now, the question is what can be done? In the earliest stage, the assault stage, ignore it. Just turn from it. I guess the easiest thing, way to think about it is for men who can get drawn into pornography, if they're not careful, you see something, you turn away from it. You see someone who's not clothed properly, you turn away from it. You see it in a movie, you turn from it. You do what I do with my wife, I go, oh God, and she laughs at me. Because you see that crap everywhere, and it's all intended to try to hook you. Know it right now. Know it, know it, and turn away from it, turn away from it. Ignore it. You don't have to fight it, you don't have to get upset, you just turn away from it, ignore it. They have no power over you any more than flies. And that's how the fathers describe it. It's like flies buzzing around. You just kind of... Demons have no more power over you than loges me. That's actually the reality of it. They're they're as powerful as flies. You ignore them. But in the last stage, all you can say is that it takes the grace of the Holy Spirit in which everything is possible for the healing of passions, addictions, and obsessions. And it can be a long, hard road, and it takes prayer and patience and begging God to recover who you are. What can we do about all of this? Obey his commandments. And with together with all the other spiritual practices and spirit, what we call spiritual warfare, we begin practicing the presence of God. We practice the presence of God through stillness. External stillness is, is when we liberate the senses of the body from the sights and appetites, diversions, particularly from bondage, which living in our contemporary world imposes on us. And if you think about it, just think of all the people who live a hectic life, they live a hectic life, and then they go out to the coast and they just go, ah. Oh. They're experiencing the beauty of God's creation in stillness. 
oh sure, those colors and those birds and there's sound of the ocean and the wind is there and there's something beautiful. But that's just like raw experience of God's creation. But it's a kind of external stillness even in that situation. It's also important that we have inner stillness, which is liberation of the heart and mind, the noose, from images, fantasies, worries, preoccupations, thinking about this, stuffing, stuffing, stuffing ourselves constantly with things. This stillness, this way of being in the presence of God, which gives us the capability of being still enough to recognize the logis, we do something comes through hesychism. Hesychism, again, is that mystical tradition of the Orthodox Church and is described in the Philokalia. Even Michael from the Buddhist Dharma Center would come, came here looking for the Philokalia to give his students. The Philokalia and the Fathers St. Silwan, the Athenite, many fathers, describe hesychism. So I'm going to try to describe it for you in a few bullet points. Hezekiah is a science relating to thoughts, the heart, and the senses. And it helps a person to be delivered from the passions to overcome death and be united with God. We must engage our will must engage in praxis or Hezekiah to manifest in our lives. We must be the doer in synergy with the grace of God. Hezekiah is essential for man's purification and perfection. This inner stillness, this peace of heart, and in the Orthodox Church, Hezekiah is a complete science for healing thoughts, the heart and the senses. Hezekiah is the way in which we acquire this spiritual knowledge of God. Everywhere I'm saying the word Hezekiah, think stillness, vigilance, silence, pure, just perception without thinking and analyzing and reacting, just stillness. Hezekiah leads to a, a kind of theology that presumes speaking about God based on knowledge and experience of him. So a theologian is a hezekist master hesychist to be a true theologian. I'm not talking about schools and the, that kind of theology. There's a, it has its place in the way our world works today. But the theologians of the church, John Chrysostom, were practitioners. They practiced silence, stillness, and vigilance. Stillness or Hezekiah, Hezekism, is the means of healing in an age of constant activity, the constant gratification of the senses, uncontrolled imagination, speculations that wear people out, worries, projections, planning. We need a break. The soul needs a break from it all. It equips us both for inner stillness and a retreat from the world of senses and imagination. But in theology, the knowledge of God it gives life meaning. So it's a break from the world, but it enlightens us about the life in God. In conclusion, Christian spiritual life, the way of life, the way of Christ, salvation, isn't Jesus making bad men better. It's Jesus making dead men live. 
Without this, we are dead men walking. Or the next crop of worm food, right, Bill? <laughs> Our Christian life is not simply a moral set of rules and behaviors. That's not what the spiritual life is, rules and behaviors and morality. It's not so that we get rewarded by going to heaven or punished by going to hell if we didn't do a good enough job. It's about being transformed. Through the traditions we've been given by the apostles, the fathers, the holy elders, it's through our Orthodox Christian worship and it's in our doctrine, it's in our theology, it's in our ascetic practice, it's in Hezekiah itself. Spiritual warfare is in all of those things if we do it in vigilance and stillness. So yeah, this is the context in which spiritual warfare is, wa is waged. Against the devil, against the world, against the flesh. Now don't just pigeonhole this. Remember this from in the context of what we study and what we're going to do next, and make your life in the church a spiritual life. Don't just follow the rules and do the customs and enjoy the people. Do all of those too. But that's just a framework. That isn't the actual spiritual life itself. It's the Christian praxis that we must follow to follow in the footsteps of the apostles and the fathers. Now, hesychism, I, I, I gave you lots of things about it, um, but there's lots of terms that we need to come to grips with. I've given you a crib sheet when we first started this class, remember, with definitions? I didn't define love because there's dozens of Greek variants. And some of this terminology is so rich in the Greek and doesn't have words in English that actually are equivalencies. For example, grace. Dozens of Greek variants to grace. All of our praxis, all of our efforts, all of our hesychism, everything we do, simply is the catalyst where grace then has its way with us. Because God will not trump us. He will not overstamp us. He will not take away our will. We have to engage for the grace to be active in us. And grace is mediated to us through the Holy Spirit. It's a ministry of the Holy Spirit, actually. What is grace? Grace is how God acts in forgiving and spiritual healing. That's God's grace. Grace is also the working of God himself through his energies. Grace is not created, which is a mistake in the West. It's not a substance of any kind that was created. It can't be treated like a commodity. Grace is referred to in the Lord's Prayer. When the Lord's Prayer says, give us this day your, our daily bread, the word in English, the best we can do it, and I forget how to say it in Greek now. I, I could say it last year, but I can't remember it now. I have to go look it up again. The word in English, though, is the super substantial substance. That's what the day, when we say the Lord's Prayer and say, give us this day our daily bread, daily bread is our super substantial substance. I can ask a hundred people, what does that mean? Give us this dear daily bread. And 99 out of 100 will talk about the stuff. The stuff they eat, the stuff they need, they get a little philosophical about it, etc. But they don't even know what the Lord's Prayer means. Again, I urge you, as your homework assignment while we're gone, get the podcast. Ancient Faith Radio, Father Thomas Hopko on the Lord's Prayer. Hear how God's grace works. Hear how he has given us his substance. I'm almost, I'm still not out of time, yay. Uh, but do that, that's grace. Grace is the super substantial substance that God bestows upon us. 
Super substantial means not of this world, not of creation. There's lots of words that are foundational. You know, you have it in your crib sheet about Harmarsha, asceticism. We need to learn what that means because people in the world are called to be ascetics too, not just monks. Hesychism is the foundation for asceticism. You heard the word today, catharsis. That means purification. So when we hear the word purification, catharsis in Greek. Theoria, illumination, theosis, deification, we had those. Theologian are those who with a pure heart, the unity of heart and the noose, pure heart, a purified heart, experience the revelation of God within and speak with an illumined mind without error about God. Theolo theology is speaking about God intellectual sorry I can't even I wrote this I mean I tried to make it so I'd understand my notes but <laughs> I can't even read my own typing let alone handwriting okay theology a little aside speaking about God intellectually is not possible without error do you hear that? I don't care what you study. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how many PhDs you've got. If you're speaking intellectually only, it's not possible to speak without error, as well-meaning as you are. It is only possible through revelation to the pure human noose, to those who've experienced theosis, or at least theoria at a minimum, that God can be picture of God and his working can be without error. That's why those who have experienced God never want to talk about it, because it's impossible. Even if they've experienced it, not just in life. The intellectuals love to write books and papers and pontificate about all of the things they know about God. Those who experience God don't want to say anything. They want to go hide in the woods and stand in his presence. Of course, you know what the noose is. You hear the term when I'm praying noetic on your noetic altar? It's of the noose. It's that angelic, pure, it's of the realm of not of this world. Noetic is made possible by hesychism's development of the noose. And the last word that I have on here that you also have in there, which is tied to hesychism, so I didn't, wanted to bring it out, is nepsis. Nepsis. Really an important world. It's sober-minded vigilance, sobriety, and watchfulness, which is required at all stages of seeking God and encountering God. Nepsis is the result of hesychism. If we're living in struggling with our spiritual practice of being a Christian, of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, and attending divine services, and living the life that the church has given us, we do that in hesychism, then nepsis is the condition that we'll have, sober-minded vigilance. Is there a root word to nepsis? What is the meaning of root of a root word? It is, uh, I don't know. It is the root. There could be a different variant. It's taken from there in the etymology. Be interesting. I, I haven't looked that up. The context of all theology, all the things that we try to teach and all the things we try to do when we pray and do services is neptic because it is meant to be vigilant, sober, and watchful. So we come into the church vigilant, sober, and watchful. Stillness, trying to achieve inner stillness and try to then participate in divine worship. Expect 
that God will 